racetrack at Dragon Con. And now, let's start the show. Alright, so uh, it's Monday. Uh, is everybody alive? Uh, are you hungover? Nope. Oh. Maybe. Okay. Actually, no. We wouldn't Quite be possibly. Here. Wow, that's the reason why you're here. <laughs> There's a. I, I would. I every morning at Dragon Con, I usually walk over to the Starbucks and pick up something to like, you know, drink and then possibly munch on. And like every morning, it's like completely empty. It's like <laughs> you feel like does anybody like is anybody here? And then like on every year on Monday, it's crowded. And it's crowded with people that are so hungover. I'm like. There, there was some girls there where I was like, I don't think they even know they're alive because they were just like, I was, it, it's crazy because I don't know what it is about Mondays at Dragon Con, it's a little weird. Um, okay, so we're going to learn about how to maybe live to 100 years old. You're probably not going to and you're probably going to die. That's loser talk. <laughs> Step one, don't yeah, volunteer to help your friends load their truck. <laughs> I almost took it out this morning. So, so this man to my left here, uh, he does accurate stuff, and his job basically is to figure out when you're going to die. So who's going to take Ooh. over? Sure. <laughs> if he spent five years ago. Um, hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hello. That works surprisingly well. Uh, my name's Terry Robinson, and I'm an actuary. Um, I'm a credentialed member of the Casualty Actuary Society which has been predicting doom for a little over a century now. Get all um, the girls with that I, I do. I do. I usually can't say it in public, otherwise the underwear just coming at me will make it hard to continue a conversation. <laughs> um, so, to, to be more specific, actuaries are kind of broken down into two flavors. Life and health actuaries, and then everyone else, which is sometimes politely referred to as general <clears throat> insurance. I'm a general insurance actuary. Um, this presentation is kind of broken up into two parts. One where we talk about your odds of like dying due to a cocaine overdose, and the other one where we talk about things like heart attacks. I really know nothing about that second half. So if you're like, I have mesothelioma, I'll be like, I'm sorry, next question. Um, so again, so as that, I'm kind of a generalist. Um, what I actually do kind of on a day-to-day -day basis is I, I, I figure out when bad things are going to happen and what they're going to cost. I'm in reinsurance, which is insurance for an insurance company. Um, like, every time I say that, I really just want to go with Yo Dog. Um, and I haven't had opportunity to yet because I work with actuaries. Um, and they can't hear me over the sound of how much money they make. Um, actuaries are regularly um, indicated as like the best job in America. Every once in a while, we'll be dethroned and be number two, and then mysterious circumstances, we're number one the next year. <laughs> Which I've always kind of enjoyed. Um, but I spend most of my time dealing with things like uh, large fires, um, train derailments, um, a, a little bit of active shooter situations. Um, but we get, to, we get to see a lot of interesting claim descriptions of which my favorite so far is still two small but well-meaning children burn down church. <laughs> I feel like the skeptics track can get behind that. <laughs> um, they, they were, they were well-meaning then. Yes. <laughs> but I just like the fact that they included the but well-meaning part. Like that was, that was part of the official report. Um, sometimes at a party, someone who doesn't care will ask me what I do, and I will tell them actuary is from the Algonquin word meaning friend, and they will nod, and that was the moment I realized that as a white man, if I say something with confidence, most people will listen to me, which is a terrifying power. Um, here we sit nodding at you. In addition to that, sometimes I will tell them that as an actuary, I have been entrusted by the Lady of Fate, that when someone's time of departure comes, that I will meet them at the shroud between the living and the dead and lead them into the afterlife. As an actuary, I am sworn into a legion uh, who has dominion over a particular mode of death. And as a property casualty actuary, I work for the Emerald Legion with dominion over people who died in accidents. If you're a dork, you'll realize that's the plot of Wraith the Oblivion. <laughs> um, and my personal record for talking about this before someone said, 
that doesn't seem right. 22 minutes. <laughs> so I went an entire episode of Seinfeld talking about the uprising of the Smiling Lord during the Great War, and this person just nodded. <laughs> I hope that person was like, okay, I know what he's doing. Let's see who cracks first. <laughs> um, again, I'm a generalist. A lot of this research depends on the expertise of others. I will make mention to uh, wonder.cdc.gov. Um, for all the presentations I've done this weekend, it's involved the CDC, the U.S. Geological Survey, or some other government agency. I don't care how libertarian you are, it's incredibly useful to have just like a bunch of people that collect information on how people die. If you have a third party that's going to do that for a fee for half the price, we can talk about that as a business model. Um, but if you have any specific questions, I'll be glad to give you my card if I can't answer it at the time and try and get back to you on it. Or if later you're like, hey Terry, I saw this study, can you help me figure out what's going on here? I'll be more than happy to shrug my shoulders along with you. Um, additionally, actuaries have a small exemption to the McCarran, um, what was it, the McCarran-Ferguson Antitrust Act, uh, no, pardon me, the Sherman Antitrust Act. Um, insurance companies are regulated at the state level, so anytime an actuary gives a presentation, we have to include an antitrust notice. Um, I don't think that's really going to be a concern here. But this is a big thing for me, because this is the first time I got to use this slide. So thank you, Skeptic Track and Dragon Con, for allowing that dream of mine to come through. That's um, why you wanted to do it. This is a big day for me, like, peace out. Um, <laughs> now the underwear really starts yeah, falling. Yeah. Oh. Antitrust and calculator owner. Um, <laughs> ladies. Um, so the first actuarial estimates were made by uh, Nicholas Barbon in the wake of the Great Fire of London. It was kind of funny when the Great Palace was being rebuilt after the Great Fire. Um, they included a thing for the General Office of Insurance, which was really um, aspirational because no insurance companies existed yet. Um, it was kind of like a British cargo cult, like if we had set up this thing in the desert in the 50s and been like, spaceport! <laughs> um, and this was him, and he was, his, his father was a, uh, was like the Puritan. His middle name was, if Christ had not died for thee, thou hast been damned. Um, so yeah, it took a while for him to sign his name. <laughs> the first life estimates were made by William Talbot and Sir Thomas Allen, who didn't have nearly as interesting middle names. I think it's like Robert. Um, and they had come up with an insurance company that said, hey, we have a lot of pastors and they keep dying. And a lot of them had like wives and children and we would like them to get money. So they set up a pension fund and after 20 years, they calculated that they would need to have saved um, some, something on the order of 56,200 pounds sterling at the time. They were over by one, by one pound, um, which is pretty good using 1600s level technology but by prices right rules, they still lost. Um, <laughs> but they tried. So modern actuarial science is this remarkably sophisticated blend of incredibly complicated math. Um, but on the other end of the spectrum, does anyone here own a freshwater boat? Good, you're all reasonable people. <laughs> I, I wanted to create a web page called shouldibuyafreshwaterboat.com that it would ask you a whole bunch of questions and no matter what you picked, it would just say no. <laughs> um, so freshwater insurance rates are still set by a guy, um, almost in all cases a guy, walking out, looking at your boat and going, $40 a month, and it has worked for over a century. Like, there has never been like a catastrophe that, that like threw the freshwater boat insurance market into turmoil. It's just a guy being like, eh, eh. So like, sometimes I feel like I'm not actually doing anything useful, I'm not. Um, so death to an actuary is remarkably simple. If any of you are in the medical field, I fully recognize that for you it's complicated. Um, an actuary's definition of death is whatever the state says it is. And I was surprised to find that the definition of dead varied from state to state. 
you figure that would be somewhat uniform? It was like, he's dead, Jim, not in Missouri. <laughs> I didn't know that. That's, that's how that worked. Um, the basic unit that an actuary generally cares about is the year, because over the course of a year, like we make the simplification that your odds of dying in the second three months of the year are the same as the first three months. The exception to that pretty well is people over the age of like, a hundred, um, and if you want to like stand there with your hands akimbo and be like, Mr. Robinson is a super centurion, I, I'm offended by your numerical simplification, I'll be like, shut up and go back to talking about how you shook the hand of like, Warren G. Harding. <laughs> um, so the first actuarial like concept we're going to kind of talk about is the idea of a mortality rate. Um, this, is, this involves one of the trickier examples of actuarial math, it's called division. You take the number of people in a group who died due to some cause in a year, and usually divide it by a thousand. So uh, we're, we're going to start out with an amazing example. Um, it's also often presented as a percentage, but if you just see a report and it says mortality rate, three, um, that's probably three in a thousand. Um, so I live in a business factory. Um, if you think of the most generic office space humanly possible with like the word achieve stenciled on the wall and an attractive person of color in a business suit nodding at another person, um, that's where I work. Um, we had this publication of like what it's like to work at my company and every picture, I don't know how they picked it, like all the, all the little insert uh, pictures, the, there were people talking at tables near sunlit windows and such, but the object that was in sharpest focus in all of them were the pens on the table. And like, I don't know, is that a subliminal marketing thing or something? I'm not entirely sure. So this year I got 10 plants for my incredibly dull office, and people were like, oh my god, you got 10 plants. I got two orchids, a peace lily, four philodendra, one uh, ivy, and two, that is the technical way of pluralizing the word cactus. Most people, most people don't know that. Um, <laughs> and in the first year, um, there were some deaths. <laughs> this is why when people are like, oh, are you and your housemate going to get a dog? I'm like, I killed a cactus. <laughs> I don't want a cat. Awesome, that would kill me. Um, so there was a bit of a learning curve, and I lost a philodendra because I watered it too little, and I lost the ivy because I watered it too much. And the orchid just died. Um, I asked an orchid expert about that, and I'm like, hey, why did my orchis, orchid die? And he said, because they die sometimes. <laughs> I didn't realize that like all people who raise orchids that work in accounting are also like Buddhists. <laughs> there, that's a degree of serenity I wish I were able to take to the rest of the world. Um, so if we want to use this as an example, so three out of ten plants died. So if you're a plant owned by me in my workplace, 30% mortality. Um, being a plant in my workplace is deadlier than being on the Eastern Front during World War II. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Um, two died due to uh, watering issues, so we could say that there was a 20% mortality rate due to water in all office plants. We could also say that the philodendra, uh, or I guess philodendron, uh, mortality rate was 25%. One philodendron died out of four philodendra, 25%. <coughs> Are you following so far? Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. Oh, yeah. I figure any math that can be done on like that giant Mr. Wizard calculator where it's like Mr. Math or whatever it was that came out in the 80s should be like roughly followable. Or you can just lie. Um, so I came up with a bunch of versions. This is my first time presenting at a convention of this type. Um, or this is the first convention of this type at which I presented. There we go. And I wasn't sure what track was going to take me. Um, I originally posited it to the science track under some weird contrivance. And then I'm like, oh, by the way, I'm also proposing it to other, and never got a response. I didn't realize there was this like Sunni Shiite Biggie Tupac fatwa between the tracks. Um, and like, I had different versions of this presentation that I was going to use, 
and one was going to be like the apocalypse rising, like how to stay healthy for the apocalypse, and one for like the space track that was going to be like survive your way to Mars. And like I got real desperate and was thinking about the paranormal track, and I'm like how to make it to 100 and be spooky. <laughs> and I have no concept of what the paranormal track does, but whenever you see a more and like the fact that they're like right below us, right? No, the Sheridan. Oh, the Sheridan. Yeah. Like it's. Like, wasn't there a year where they were immediately next to each other? Yeah. No? No, there wasn't. Darn. I was hoping at least for, like, the Far Side comic in my head that that had happened. <laughs> they've um, always been at the Sheridan. I think it, that was the first year we actually started to use the Sheridan. Okay. They started. So whenever you see a mortality rate, um, this happens a lot in the news. Try and see what population they're looking at, like white males, um, what, what the actual rate is what the cause is, and the time period. The one that annoys me the most, like usually it's over a year, uh, but sometimes they'll be like, 74 year mortality rating for like sniffing asbestos. And you're like, is that really surprising? <laughs> um, so sometimes you'll get a projection. I live in Philadelphia. Um, we had to represent uh, <laughs> heroin capital of America, um, home of Comcast. I know you all love us. Um, bridge. Yeah, what was that? The Wall Women Bridge. Yeah. yeah they, they, they don't still call it that? It's the, wait, the Wall Women? The Wall Women, they pronounce it Wall Women. Oh, I wouldn't surprise me. Um, hey, like, I, I was over there two years, I probably got it wrong. That's fine. <laughs> I mean, we say water, and we say Center City instead of, yeah. like, downtown. And like whenever someone comes and they're like, hello, I wish to visit your downtown. I always assume it's like three children inside of a trench coat, because who says downtown Philly? <laughs> or alternatively, like it's very obviously a Soviet spy. They're like, hello, American chum, I wish to visit your downtown. Like normal tourist men, yeah. <laughs> you're like, America is great, let's have Ziki. Um, and it has the highest homicide rate um, of any city with more than one Philly, million people, go Philly. Um, and people are like, is Philly a violent place? And my response is, this is how we reacted to winning the Super Bowl. This is a planter. You're, you're not showing the man Jack by being like, yeah, take that, conifers. <laughs> um, we, we tore down street signs for no particular reason. We had to grease our light poles, and people were like, that's stupid, and my response is, it worked. <laughs> batteries at Santa. Well, we threw batteries at Santa. That's been a while, though. Um, I think my favorite example of peak Philadelphia is there was a neighborhood of Philadelphia for, no, in the uh, 1800s known as Helltown. Um, it's now known as Northern Liberties. Um, and if I had bought a house there five years ago and then sold it four years ago, I would be giving this presentation from my yacht. Um, <laughs> And there was this Protestant Catholic riot, and um, the cops just kind of watched for a while. And um, eventually, the mayor's like, "You're going to you really uh, do something about this." So the cops, the cops saw the riot and just started beating up Catholics. <laughs> which, as a Catholic, I can't argue with them. <laughs> so, in 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 2017, we had a murder scare. Um, if that's a thing. And there were two people killed on New Year's. People don't normally get killed on New Year's. It's, it's like this agreement we all have, like, don't shoot people until the second. Um, and uh, there were 28 further uh, homicides in January for a total of 13, 30 in 2017. There were 18 in the prior year. And um, the papers, there's a, so that's a 66% rise um, for the month of January. but. The papers reported it as an over 60% rise in homicide, um, and how there would be 450 people killed that year if this trend continued. But the trend didn't continue, because you looked at one month. Like These are the death totals for January for the previous five years, and also over this time, the, uh, the population was increasing a lot, thanks millennials, of which I am one. How did the thing, was this the track that had the like getting inside the millennial line? Yeah. And was the, was the slide just like waiting for baby boomers to die? <laughs> um, <laughs> like, like 50 minutes of just us going like, come on, house prices. <laughs> so, 
so when we look at a statistic, we need to we need to try and figure out what they're actually presenting. Um, so let's look at car crashes. Um, so in 2016, 37,500 people died in car crashes out of 2.7 million people um, who died that year out of 323 million people in total. Is it reasonable to say you have a one in 10,000 chance of dying in a car accident in a year? Um, what do you think this number might be leaving out? I wasn't sure if I was going to have notes, so I just like just put it in the slide, Terry. Um, so when you look at this statistic, what are you being like? I don't have a one in ten thousand chance audience participation. Any ideas? Anyone? Miles driven? Yeah, it doesn't tell you anything about miles driven. Like if I'm like a, a coked up drug runner or something, maybe my odds are different than like the little old lady who takes her car just a dialysis or whatever it is old people do these days. Um, <laughs> Um, it also leaves out the fact that, what if you don't drive? Right. <laughs> like, like, what if you're bedridden? It would be very impressive. Like, I just picture, like, Jim, we have some numbers to meet this month. There's a little old lady that is trying to live out her days peaceably. Here's, here's Mark, the ending car, and it's just this car with this, like, cattle catch on the front of it. <laughs> vehicle collision, about 14% of uh, people who die in auto accidents in a year are pedestrians, 2% are bicyclists. Um, sadly, sadly, the, um, the National Institute for Highway Safety um, does not differentiate between cyclists and unicyclists when it comes to bicycle mortality. As someone who has injured himself a lot trying to learn how to unicycle, I'm glad. <laughs> like the cyclists are hiding how deadly my activities were. Um, if you ever want to feel like you're flying, get a self-balancing unicycle. Um, a unicycle is, a self-balancing unicycle is self-balancing in the same way that metaphor. So, um, <laughs> they're remarkably difficult to do. And so I had a, I had a brain injury a couple of years ago. Um, and that was messy. And my vestibular system was kind of shot. So I spent some time, I'm like, if I can figure out how to ride a self-balancing unicycle, I'm gonna say, I'm almost back to where I was before this thing took me down. And in this incredibly lame movie montage, I spent an evening doing donuts around the Walgreens across the street from me on this unicycle until I had mastered it. And I just assume in the montage there's uplifting music. But like the next day when the security guard like reviewed the footage and they just saw this like obese man going around with like, give me a tea on a unicycle for like two hours. I hope he enjoyed that. And the hardest part is he destroys really weird muscles of the body that you're not used to exercising. So I finished unicycling after three hours at like 4 a.m. because I'm cool. And I had two flights of stairs to get up to to go back to my apartment and like I couldn't lift my leg and I'm at the bottom of the stairs and I'm like, I die here. <laughs> um, so I have some homework for you and it's to go to wonder.cdc.gov which is an amazing web page. Thank you Center for Disease Control for collecting data. Um, and they make, you, they make you sign terms of service but they're the most adorable terms of service you have ever seen. It's like I promise not to figure out who these people were. So when you figure out the one guy who died last year due to pigeon fancier's lung, you're not going to go Google it immediately like I did. <laughs> and be like, who died from inhaling pigeon? Um, it's a thing, apparently. Um, and just pick a statistic and dive into it. Part of this presentation is me dealing with my own fear of death, and boy howdy did it help. So I strongly recommend pick, pick, like I, I discovered that weed whackers are only 11 times less likely to kill you than a riding lawnmower, um, and other useful things like that. Um, so when we, when we talk about this, this chance of dying over a given year, we usually express it as a force of mortality, which looks like this. Um, this, this is basically a slide to make me feel better about having spent 400 hours studying for an exam and being like, I know what those words mean. Um, but if you actually graph it, um, it looks something like this. The important thing to note is the, uh, the, the, the odds of death in any given year on that left side. So this is the odds of dying in any given year based on your age at current. 
that at current thing is a big thing. The other thing is I was thinking of having like a call and response version because I thought the skeptic track should take something from like a southern revival meeting. But like instead of me pointing at you and you going hallelujah, instead you would say, on average. <laughs> because my big reminder is everything I present is on, on average. average. They're like, I'm not gonna die at that age, Mr. Robinson. I fully understand, and if you insist on saying that over and over again, I will bring up that time of death considerably. Um, so you'll, you'll notice a few things immediately. Um, being one, being born, is remarkably deadly. Um, we will get to it later. It is roughly as dangerous as climbing the Matterhorn. Um, you are least likely to die at the age of 10. We don't know why, but 10-year-olds are basically invincible. Um, and, and then as you approach the age where you can have kids, there's kind of this period where this is mostly young men figuring out how not to die. And as you can see by the sharpness, some don't quite make it. Um, and then it just kind of steadily rises until you die. Um, so being one is about as deadly as being 50 wow. um, years old. Um, Ten-year-olds are invincible, and right now your odds of dying in any given year once you're 90 is about 10%. So this is, this is the, the odds of death per, per year. Now if we, if we reverse that and say, what are your odds of surviving? You get something like this. So that, that little thing at the top is the survival curve for humans. We seem to have this strategy where like, we're going to live a long time, we're going to have absolutely useless children um, that we have to raise for like two decades, and then they move back in. Um, that's actually genetic. People don't realize that. So other animals do that. Um, elephants. Um, like, Mom, I'm working on my art. Um, so on the other end of the spectrum, you have, you have frogs, where it's like, how many kids do you have? I don't know. <laughs> um, how long are they going to live? Good question. <laughs> um, where you have a lot of young and hope some of them make it. Um, just as an aside, if we still had a 78 year average lifespan and we died the same way frogs did, where the odds of dying in any given year is basically consistent throughout the entirety of your life, um, there would be one, you would have roughly a one, in, mo most of us would die very young, let's not dwell on that too much, but there would be roughly a one in one million chance that you would make it to the, to the age of 1200. I think that's kind of cool. Like, there would be one guy kicking around that's like, Muhammad was a nice guy, but he, he, he always burnt the toast. Um, and he'd be like, that's nice. Um, and then for some reason, there's songbirds that just never get better at living and never get worse at dying. It's pretty, pretty consistent over time. Um, then there's other, like, people are like, ah, oh, do all animals fit to this? No. Have you seen a tree? I know they're not animals. Um, have, the, or a better example would be a sea turtle where it's like, I'm gonna live forever and have a billion babies. Um, so this is, this is not a hard and fast thing, it's just there for, for contrast. Now, if that graph was too thrilling, I have put that graph in table form. Um, yeah. um, so the Social Security Administration puts together life tables, and you'll see at the top it says period life table. Um, there are theoretically two types of life tables generally. Um, all of them are going to be period tables pretty well. A period table says, um, quite simply, um, if everyone at every age, currently alive, died at the exact same rate as all the people at those current ages, at current, this is what it would look like. What the hell does that mean, Terry? Um, if we ignore the effects of war, um, so if you look at a, 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 a mortality curve for someone born in the year 1900, it's, it's a little bit different compared to what the table would have predicted. Likewise, the generation that went to World War II, um, or if you looked at the mortality table of the generations that lived through like the Black Death, that's going to be a little bit different. So what you do is you kind of assume that you, you remove the effects of large external forces, and you say, if we took the year, in this case 2015, and took all of our current mortality, um, what we know about how people die at current, and we took 100,000 of them, on average, how many would make it to each day? Um, to each year. Um, this is published by the Social Security Administration. Needless to say, they're very interested in having an accurate idea of when people die. But the big thing this does not take into consideration is improvements in mortality statistics. Um, in general, we can talk a little later about some of the upsets that have been occurring, 
But the neat thing to me is that first column, if you keep going down, which you can't because this is a slide, um, it'll give you the probability of death within any given year. Um, and as you start looking down, once you hit about 35, the odds of you dying in any given year double every nine years. Um, but, but people are like, oh my god, but like, realize it goes from, in nine years, it goes from like a one in a thousand chance of dying, which isn't bad, to two in a thousand. It's, it's after a couple of those doublings where it starts really getting messy. Like, once you hit the age of 105, every year it is just you and death playing rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> it's, it's almost literally a coin flip. Um, like, when I started doing actuarial exams, the actuarial exams stopped at, at 105. And anything after 105 is just like, you win. You freak. You crazy example of the bell curve. You win. Um, and my teacher at the time, she's like, when I started doing this actuarial table, stopped at 17. Um, and I'm like, wow, that was, that was rough. What was it like living through the Crimean War? Um, she was very old. Um, and is still around and yelling at children, which pleases me to no end. And she's like, you fancy kids with your calculators, I can do factorials of fractions in my head. 0.5 factorial, square root of pi. Um, so that that was fun. This is this goes in the, if you want to dick around with it later, do that. Again, Social Security Administration, just Google actuarial table, and it'll pop up. You'll see two kinds. One will be, what is it going to be? You'll see one that says normal use, and you might see another one that says um, annuant, which is a special kind of table used to calculate the odds of surviving someone else, which if you really want to be menacing to your spouse, just like print that out and leave it on the table. Um, so now that we get to talk about the fun stuff, we're going to talk about two types of risk as actuaries are concerned. Acute risk, it suddenly kills you. Or chronic risk, it slowly kills you. Uh, some things are both. Who enjoys alcohol? <laughs> yeah. Um, Sometimes alcohol is like, I'm going to slowly boil your liver. And in other cases, alcohol is like, hey, I'm drunk enough to drunk between these two buildings. <laughs> um, there, are, there are things that I find adorable in the literature that are described as occasionally lethal. Um, an example of this, pigeon fanciers lung. <laughs> Which if you go to the Wikipedia article is that it's described as occasionally occasionally lethal, like if this kills you, you deserved it, like stop, stop trying to like smoke a pigeon. Um, so we're going to start with acute risk because that's way more fun and includes shark attacks, leaf blower attacks, car attacks, Mars attacks, a sudden attack of pigeon fenciers lung. Um, in the 1970s, when we were, uh, when the modern science of decision uh, analysis was coming out. It was really hard to come up with a uniform way of expressing these. So we started using something called the micromort. Um, ideally, we would want um, a thing that, uh, that expresses the odds of you dying given a certain activity performed. So when we look at these statistics, if we're looking at cars, we want to do it per mile driven. We want to look at something where if you double the amount of thing you do, you double the odds that you're going to die. Hopefully, I, like hopefully, like oh man, I really hope this doubles my chance of mortality. Um, so we use the micromort, which is something that has roughly a one in one million chance of happening. I don't have a good sense of a one in a million event. Donald Trump is our president. Um, so as an example, twenty fair coins coming up heads is a one in one million chance the lamest game of Russian roulette imaginably possible, just like you with a whole bunch of dimes. Um, this is some more interesting ones that I was able to find. Uh, a devastating earthquake hitting Seattle in the next five hours, or a devastating earthquake hitting San Francisco in the next 50 minutes. <laughs> uh, and if you look at the total number of people being born, the rate at which we seem to go through precedence, you assume an average term of about six years, a one in one million chance that one of the next 24 babies being born becoming president. Which I thought was kind of a fun but utterly useless one because that in no way provides context. So I'm going to stick with the 20 coins coming up heads. Um, so what, what would correspond to one micromort? Uh, who here lives in the United Kingdom or United States? Woo! 
Um, in the US, you have basically a one in one million chance of being taken out each day by an accident of some sort besides violence. Um, so it is re the term injury is used. And that's one of those things where you're like, injury? Like, if two people like take each other out in a gunfight, that's considered an injury. Uh, the other one that gets really messy is suicide, which in the US we consider an injury because that's, that's what takes you out. Um, in the UK, one, one micromort a day from, uh, from all causes. So uh, now that things got real heavy real fast, let's look at some examples. Um, so these are all things that have roughly a one in one million chance of killing you. Um, Driving 240 miles in a car, um, 90 miles in a truck, and by truck I mean like large truck, not like F950 or whatever the cool kids are driving these days. Or walking or cycling 24 miles. Um, these all have roughly a one in one million chance of killing you. Um, obviously there are going to be exceptions to this. Uh, certain vehicles are going to be safer than one another, but we're doing this on, on average. average. <laughs> um, so that's like, but like, think of how many miles you've driven. By definition, everyone here has survived every mile that they have driven. And again, the life expectancy in the United States is nearly 80. So like, we go through a lot of miles and nothing bad happens. This is, this is mostly a commentary on how hard it is to assess that one in one million chance. Um, now, these are, these are some of the, uh, this is kind of the normal ways we usually get around. Um, in addition to that, motorcycle, uh, four miles per micromort. Um, trains, this one, I didn't realize how seemingly safe trains were. Uh, 6,600 uh, miles per micromort. And a fair number of those are um, like people being hit by trains because they're like, I'm going to park my car on a train. Um, drunk people do it a lot. It's surprising. <laughs> Or people being like, I'm literally going to play on the tracks. Um, commercial airlines, 7,500 miles per micromort, which isn't necessarily a useful thing. Um, the, the, the odds of, of, of there being a plane at, uh, crash of some sort is, is a factor of 60 higher what, during takeoff and landing. Like when you're in the sky, you're pretty well fine. Um, so just to give an idea of how safe a plane is in terms of distances, if you wanted to on average, die to a plane crash, you would have to fly from the Earth to Pluto and back because you forgot your space plane keys <laughs> and then back to Pluto. But the odds are actually much higher because you would die because you're in space on a plane. <laughs> so maybe that was a bad example. Um, a better way of putting plane, uh, plane flight, in my opinion, is 50 flights per micromort. So you have to fly 50 times. So you have to fly, you have, you have to fly 12 and a half times for the equivalent lethality of driving a motorcycle one mile. <laughs> like, yeah, they're great on gas though. Um, <laughs> so um, small planes are death traps. Who here took a Learjet here? Good. Um, they are. They are well over, um, what was it? It was like 7,000% deadlier, which is sounds like something you get on the sticker on the outside of a box for like a knife or something. 7,000% like deadlier than the next leading brand. Assassins recommend four out of five. The fifth one's Jim and he just used rocks. 97% um, of all fatalities involving planes are, uh, are due to small aircraft. That's 12 micromorts, uh, 12 miles per micromort, or a micromort every five minutes. That is roughly 10 times deadlier than serving in Afghanistan during the height of the surge. Wow. Yeah. So whenever like a one percenter takes a jet, I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you do that. Um, so those are, those are the fun things. Um, the next one we're going to talk about are jobs. Uh, 4,800 people uh, were killed in 2016 in the workplace. Most of these are slip and fall. And I'm like, oh wow, people must like fall over and then they break a hip or something bad happens. I forgot that this includes like construction workers that fall from high rises. Um, I'm like, oh, that is a slip and fall a lot. So, <laughs> um, so that comes out to 32 micromorts a year. Um, that comes out to roughly a tenth of a micromort per working day. There is a 
wild sex imbalance here, that it is 6 for women and 55 for men. Maybe I should stop playing, spin the tail on the dagger with my coworkers, and that's what's causing this. Most of these are actually vehicle accidents, so people who are professional drivers, if you exclude that, it drops to about 22 micromorts a year. Um, so what do you think the deadliest jobs are? Now, mind you, these are, these are based on government statistics, so it's not going to include things like assassin, uh, fisherman, and, and fisherman, and worker. commercial, fishing, commercial fishing, construction worker, uh, farmer. Did you say barber? Farmers. Oh, farmer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, I watched, I, I watched Luke Cage. It is not a profession. <laughs> That's overstated. What was that? Pigeon handler. Pigeon handler. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see how your guesses compared. Um, the deadliest by far, logging. Oh, that's yeah. that's 5.5 a day. Wow. So it's weird to think that my if I were to go to work via motorcycle, that would be as deadly as being a logger. Um, number two is fishing, flight crew. Now I did some investigation on this one. This appears to be air crew. Um, and the reason is, one, there's not a huge number of air professionals. And two, um, usually when that little turbulence sign comes on, they're not buckled in. And a remarkable number of people eventually experience terminal injuries due to that. Um, mm. This doesn't appear to include ground crew, so um, the, the actual number one cause here is exhaustion. So you have someone who does an international flight and um, they just stay awake for 24 hours and they're in their 60s and wow. that doesn't look. Um, number four, roofing. Number five, garbage man. The one I found interesting was uh, police officers, 14th. So, uh, yeah, um, line of fire, uh, one-tenth as deadly as walking. Um, so the next one I have are extreme sports. I don't know if that's legible, like if that text isn't large enough, but um, I think my favorite here is just, just kind of a note. Most of the people that die doing extreme sports are people who are pushing the edge of some sort. Like my favorite one is skydiving at eight, at eight micromorts. It's two if you're strapped to a dude. So like when you do that first tandem jump and they're like, I'm like baby's first skydiving, like those are remarkably safe. Who knew literally being strapped to a professional would reduce your chances <laughs> of mortality? Uh, likewise with scuba diving. Um, I enjoy scuba if you are if, if it is one of your first dives and you're not in an overhead environment, it's about two. Um, if you're doing something like cave diving um, or, uh, or something like that, it, it, can, it can jump considerably. Uh, running a marathon, seven micromorts. Climbing the Matterhorn, 2,840. Um, climbing Everest, uh, 30, 38,000 nearly. Hang gliding, eight. So I really wanted to go hang gliding, and um, I called up a place, and it was billed as, we will help anyone hang glide. And I'm like, I'm anyone. So I called them, and I'm like, hi, I'm fat, can I hang glide? And they said, yeah, how fat are you? Um, I said 350 pounds, they're like, that's too fat. <laughs> and I'm like, hey buddy. Um, and I'm like, well, what's the maximum weight? They're like 250. And uh, what, about, what about on the other end? What if, I'm like, you have tandem ones, don't you? They're like, yeah, for training purposes, what's the maximum weight on that? They said 400. I'm like, don't you have like, I don't know, a, a preternaturally intelligent child that I could go with, or maybe, or maybe like a talking badger, or, or a dwarf or something that I could go hang climbing with. And they're like, no, sir, I'm sorry, we can't do that. Not, not that we, not, not like they couldn't literally do that, but like we have that facility, but we're not going to give it to you. And then the man very excitedly called me back the next day, um, and he's like, Mr. Robinson, we have the thing for you. I'm like, what's that? We have a new water jetpack. Um, it's, so it's a reaction jetpack where it just shoots water down, and second law of, of Newtonian thermo chemistry fight club, <laughs> you go up. Um, <laughs> and I'm like, what's the maximum weight? He's like, 360 pounds. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I better skip breakfast then. <laughs> so, so, so I could live my dream of being two to three feet off the ground. <laughs> so I have a friend of mine who's also interested in it, and he weighs 120 pounds because he's better than me. And, um, and I just picture me doing it, and like my feet are still touching the ground. I'm like, wee, the joy of flight. And he's just whipping around like a balloon that's been popped. They failed to recalibrate it. These things are only $5,000. 
So when I pass my last actuarial exam, if you see someone like newspaper headlines of obese actuary killed in Delaware River using <laughs> water jetpack, <laughs> they're used up as micromorts. Um, and now on to the most extreme sport, being born. Uh, on the day of your birth, you uh, it's roughly 2,750 micromorts. Uh, someone in the U.S. So how do we get to this number? Someone in the U.S. is born roughly every eight seconds. Someone dies every 11 seconds. Um, someone immigrates to the United States, at least in 2016, every 33 seconds. So every 17 seconds, there's one more American, um, which I thought was just a cool statistic. It doesn't really pertain to anything. Um, so. Um, Again, four million babies born. So the thing that annoyed me about this presentation was I frequently had to calculate the number of minutes in a year, and every time I did, like, 525,000, like, like, just ran through my head, I'm like, damn you, Tay Diggs. Um, so you divide, and you get 2,750 micromorts on average. So um, depending on who you ask, this number will very much change, depending on what you include as dead. Um, so if you're curious about the exceptions to that, we can go over that. Um, it's kind of goes to talk about dead babies in the PowerPoint. So uh, continuing on. Uh, being born is as dangerous as climbing the Matterhorn. Please do not let babies climb the Matterhorn. <laughs> <laughs> they already have enough of an uphill climb to do. And now my favorite slide, um, drug use. So two years ago, Matt, raise your hand. Matt and I did LSD in a forest in New York, and it was amazing. This is not an endorsement. It was great. <laughs> and I tried to find the number of people who died directly due to LSD. And like, even on the CDC webpage, it's like, yeah, I heard my cousin knows a guy. And like, <laughs> so I was not able to find good statistics for LSD. Weed is also a questionable statistic because of how you include it. Like in the US, if you're high on cocaine and run into a tree, it's the cocaine's fault, but if you're high on cocaine in the United Kingdom and run into a tree, it's the tree's fault. Um, <laughs> so some of these statistics are really kind of an apples and oranges thing. Um, MDMA, I don't know why the authors of this one paper were really like banging on about how safe or deadly MDMA could be. They're like, five short tons of MDMA is consumed in the United Kingdom every year. We counted. I'm like, okay, that's a lot of raves that you went to. Um, and on the less fun side, um, prescriptions are another one where it's very hard to figure out what the mortality is. It gets very messy. People who are using, who are specifically taking the wrong dose to get some sort of uh, non-therapeutic effect, we'll call it politely. Um, but needless to say, don't do heroin, um, and please don't do cocaine. But if you do cocaine, you can do it roughly three times as much as heroin. Um, <laughs> the same level of lethality. Uh, we don't have any data on synthetics yet. Um, I realized I was living in an episode of SVU when I was telling a coworker that there was a guy who was going down the street punching in windows and pushing in air conditioners. He was high on something the kids called K2. And then like, as that sentence came out of that mouth, in my mouth, he looked at me, he's like, are you Ice Cube? <laughs> and I'm like, no, I'm an actuary. Um, so nine in 10 poisonings in the US is now due to a drug overdose. Skeptical call to action. Take Narcan training if it's available in your area. Um, I'm a Boy Scout. I'm an Eagle Scout. I'm a Vigil in the Order of the Arrow, which are the nerds in scouting that the Eagle Scouts go, that guy's a nerd. <laughs> um, and I've come across in a number of cases in the city in the year where there was a situation where despite being Red Cross certified for like all the, door, the, the, like the normal stuff, there was nothing I could do because the person was overdosing and there were bodily fluids involved. Um, take arcane training, take a kit. Um, so again, on to more fun things, death by asteroid. Um, this one also involves complicated actuarial math. So people are like, Terry, what's the odds of dying in a, in a, in a meteor strike? Um, and then I go, zero, because once they cross the atmosphere, they're a meteorite. Oh. Um, <laughs> my virginity just grew back. Um, so in the past 600 million years, there have been three ex extinction-level events. Um, we had the Chichalup, Traeger, 
crater. Wow, Freudian slip there. Good job, asteroid. Um, and two others that I don't want to butcher their names. I'm going to assume that zero people would have survived those, or it would have rounded down to zero on the scale of six billion or eight billion people. So that comes out to uh, 0.005 microvorts. If you include smaller impacts, we round this off to one in the lifetime, um, which comes out to about the odds of dying in an alligator attack, or due to pigeon fence here as well. <laughs> oh, it also is roughly the odds of you dying in a lethal paper cut. Um, the CDC has, what was the list it as? Um, fibers, paper, uh, not other, uh, fibers, paper, lacer, uh, fiber, oh, fibers, wood pulp product, not otherwise classified. So I assume that's death by paper cut. Um, so now we have a framing where we can talk about equivalences. Um, so taking heroin for two weeks is about the same as base jumping. Um, your odds of dying in general anesthesia is, um, is about 1 in 250,000 or 4 micromorts. Um, this was fun when I was going in for surgery and they're like, oh, what do you do? I'm like, I'm an actuary who assesses med mal risk. Um, <laughs> ladies. Um, and he's like, and the anesthesiologist is like, the surgery is quite safe. I'm like, I understand the surgery is safe. You're the guy that kills me. He's like, I will kill you. I put you to sleep. I'm like, it's a medically induced coma, and we're not quite sure how it works. And he's like, but we got some ideas. Let's get you into the OR. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that, was, that was fun. Um, so this kind of gives you a common framework. Now, the interesting thing is, as you age, um, the number, the, the odds of dying in any given day increase. So we have this thing called relative risk reduction, where old people are remarkably fine skydiving. And I think that's just swell. Like, I hope we have, we have this population of baby boomers skydiving and doing MDMA. That would be great on house prices. Um, the other thing that microboards allow us to do is, is compare relative versus absolute risk. Absolute risk is the odds of an event happening, and relative risk is the odds of an event happening given, given some treatment in a statistical sense. The treatment might be, they took this ointment. The treatment might be, this guy smoked. So whatever makes one group different from another. Um, this person was born male uh, versus the odds of the event happening without the treatment. So an illustrative example, this pops up a lot in medical studies, and it annoys the Jesus out of me when people are like, being born with a prostate increases your odds of prostate cancer by 12 billion percent. And you're like, that told me nothing. Um, so the NISD reported that, uh, that your odds of dying in a car accident if you don't wear your seatbelt is 500% higher. Um, that, I mean, is true. But what does it mean? I feel way more useful to say it goes from two in a thousand to 10 in a thousand. So I like indicating both absolute risks because sometimes the risk isn't big enough to care about in the first place. Um, so micromorts are an absolute risk measure. Now we're gonna talk about the second fun part which is chronic risks. This is much messier and if you say, well what about blah, I will not approvingly. Um, and the reminder is these numbers are all on the average. average. Thank you. We assume that in chronic risk that things are proportional or linear, that if you smoke 10 cigarettes a day, that is half as deadly as 20 a day. So for an example, I weigh 350 pounds. Each 11 pounds over the target weight, the American Heart Association says, uh, shaves about 0.8 years off of my life. So that comes out for me to 12.4 years, because I'm fat, and I'm trying to lose weight, needless to say. So we assume that these things are proportional. And if we look at that life table that we saw before, sometime in your 20s, you have about 57 years left, which comes out to about um, 1 million half hours. Um, so if you're an adult and you're in this panel, you have blown 1 500,000th of your remaining life on me. So thank you and I'm sorry. Um, and so we're gonna call anything that shortens or lengthens your life by 30 minutes to be a micro life. So there's a couple of ways that people talk about this. People can say that it's the clock of your life running down slower um, or something like that. Add and subtract 30 minutes is fine. It's one of those things where like adding a percent and subtracting a percent aren't going to be the exact same number. If you're at 80, a 25% increase gets you to 100, a 25% decrease does not get you back down to 80. Like, so we just need to remember that. But considering we're talking about a million, and we're adding one to it, or subtracting one, I'm gonna call it about the same. 
So my, most micro life adjustments are going to be due to uh, to quality of life things. Um, each, if, if, if you lose or gain a micro life a day, that's going to come out to about 0.8 years of life expectancy over the course of your life. So here's an example. Um, the, one of the common calibrations is smoking. Um, lifelong smokers on average in the U.S. live about 10 years fewer, uh, depending on what you smoke. This assumes filtered cigarettes. Um, and the cohort study was something ginormous. It was in the tens of millions. Um, thanks, 50s. Um, so the average smoker consumed, uh, technically this is a median, that's an error I made, uh, 372,000 cigarettes in a lifetime, 10 years, that's 5.25 million minutes, 520, anyway. Um, so that comes out to about 14 minutes a cigarette. So two cigarettes, 28 minutes, is basically a micro life. So each two cigarettes shaves a millionth of your remaining life off. Now you could be like, Terry, um, how, how did you calibrate this? Well, the way the study was done, they also looked at studies of people who stopped smoking um, and then compared their future life expectancy. And lo and behold, stopping smoking, you get most of, you get that time back for the cigarettes you didn't smoke, or more accurately, the effect seems to stop. Now, mind you, with almost all of these, um, for, for, for things like drug use, they tend to be less impactful early on and more impactful later on, slightly. Um, again, we're talking about this on average. Thank you. Like, as I go on, it gets a little less exciting each time, which it should on average. Um, so here's, here's some lifestyle ones. The first 20 minutes of exercise you do in a day uh, gives you an hour. That's pretty amazing. That's like 40 free minutes. Um, if you do an additional 40 minutes of exercise, it's only one micro life, and then it falls off rapidly after that until you start approaching the marathoner level where it starts killing you. So, <laughs> moderation. Each extra 11 pounds of weight um, you have over what the American Heart Association recommends is it shaves off one micro life a day. A day. Wow. Um, yeah, I'm really trying to lose weight. Um, <laughs> three ounces of red meat in a day, so an extra hamburger, because we all consume slightly under a fifth pounder. Um, is minus one. Uh, five fruits and veggies, though, plus four. Whee! Um, and 10 to 15 ounces of coffee. So the original research said two to three cups. And I asked a bunch of people, I'm like, what's a cup of coffee? And, so, and, and I got answers that ranged from um, eight ounces, because that's a cup, to 24 ounces. <laughs> um, so that's like, I like the idea of someone being like, 72 ounces of coffee is normal in a day. I'm like, no, that's called tachycardia. Um, so 10 to 15 ounces of coffee seems to have a slight increase. Um, so these are all lifestyle changes that we can make if we're really concerned. And the point is you choose. You will figure out the things that make you happy. Um, what is it? Um, no lifespan is long enough to justify spending your dotage eating Weetabix, I think was the, the, the phrase I found, which is like shredded wheat but boring. Um, <laughs> shredded wheat for people who think shredded wheat is too interesting. Um, so here's some other things that change things. And that first one is bullshit. Um, <laughs> So the clock, as a man, I have like, I go through 26 hours in a day where a woman would go through 24. Russia versus Sweden, this one is obscene. If you look at the sex breakdown of it, um, if you're a guy, you, you, you die in your 20s apparently in Russia. Uh, for women, it's, it's much lower. Or one of the ones I really like, in 2010, um, being born then versus 1910, that adds seven and a half hours a day. That's amazing. Um, also, being rich helps. So I promised you an actuarial party trick, and I will tell it to you. And this is how to estimate how someone is going to die. Um, just say 84. Um, everyone's really OK with being really, like, you're going to live to be 84. Oh, OK, that's good. That's good. Um, if it's a couple, um, subtract two for the guy. Uh, if they have a dog, maybe you want to add one, who knows. If they're already in their upper 70s, just add seven. It's, again, um, this is not a precise thing. But if, if they're older than 90, just change the topic. <laughs> um, and if they're in their hundreds, just be like, I think someone's being a little greedy. Um, um, so if you actually want to do the calculation in the US, roughly start with 82, and then subtract 0.8 years for each daily microlife. So, and um, if they say they exercise, they're lying. 
because only about 6% of people that say they exercise daily actually do 6%. I wanted to, I, I, this is something I shoot hard to get because I want to be a surprisingly fast fat man at least. Um, and I wanted to get a shirt that's like, we are the 6% and I thought that would be gauche. Um, but just say 84, it's just nice. Um, so one last thing that we really haven't talked about is how longevity is changing over time. Um, as we get, as time goes on, we're getting better at living longer. Uh, the UK estimates that if you're a, if you're born in the 2030s in the United Kingdom, you have a 30% chance of making it to 100. That's amazing. Um, you'll notice that the maximum lifespan doesn't really change. Um, and this phenomenon is referred to as compression of mortality, which sounds like an incredibly lame, like, death metal song. Um, <laughs> like, brought to you by Vice of Despair or something like that, and then someone just gives a PowerPoint slide to, like, like I expected a kick drum bass. Um, so I said I was going to tell you how to live longer, and I will. So here are my first four recommendations. Be a rich Swiss female born in the year 2030. <laughs> do we have one of any of those here? <laughs> when do we want time travel? When do we want it irrelevant? Um, <laughs> but on a more useful basis, try and stay at a healthy weight, have friends and hobbies, um, avoid harmful drug use, wear a seatbelt, uh, get moderate exercise, be honest. Um, and eat nutritive vegetables. I say that because someone's like, potatoes a vegetable, or like, chicken's a vegetable. <laughs> no, no, it's not. Um, in addition to that, um, avoid drug use and being a commercial fisherman. And the most important lesson that if you take nothing else with you, please remember, never base junk to your heroin. <laughs> I went obscenely over time, I'm sorry. Um, Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I hope you enjoyed yourself. Please fill out the thing. This is like the last thing. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to flail wildly at answering them. And if you need to go to another panel, you're more than welcome to have my card. I hope you found this engaging. Um, thank you so much for your time. This was my first time. Yay! Good job.